Uh, my name is Ido. I'm a senior researcher at a company called Kaspersky Lab. Hope you all know. Uh, if not, just type in Google FSB. No, kidding. Ah, okay. Not everyone is, is asleep after lunch. <laughs> Um, Danny uh, will introduce himself. He's a CEO of a company he owns uh, called Undot, and we both are the co-founders of VirusBay, which is a social platform for malware researchers. So let's start with the agenda for today. We're going to cover the crypto hacks, just uh, to show you a recap, like a, a map. Am I? No, okay. I thought my shadow was in the back. <coughs> We're going to talk about a recap, uh, just a timeline of all the hacks of exchanges, maybe you've seen it in the past. Uh, also, we're going to talk about APT actors targeting the crypto exchanges, and we go down into technical details. Uh, for those of you, if you're not very familiar with all the technical details, we have questions at the end. Uh, Danny will take you into the jargon of the financial sector. He's also working uh, at that sector, and the crypto markets in general, and we will do some sort of a switch from APT actors to some other known vulnerabilities uh, being conducted on or were conducted on trades around the world and now are a big trend around uh, crypto exchanges. At the last uh, section of our slides, we're gonna discuss a little bit about how we connect the dots between APT actors and the vulnerabilities that uh, somehow shifted from the uh, traditional trades to the crypto exchanges and some conclusions for you uh, for the road. So <clears throat> a quick dive into the uh, latest hacks of the crypto exchanges. Anyone recognize one of the hacks? Yeah, come on, hands. People, we are all on earth, right? So many of them are very known. Some of them were very, very uh, suspicious. Some of them were uh, in included uh, some uh, insider work, either an employee from the from the company uh, or one of the one of the directors, or <coughs> excuse me, uh, some external hack, some problem with best practices. Specifically, 2018, we've seen uh, I think the largest the largest amount of theft from crypto exchanges. One of them was CoinCheck, uh, uh, which is originated in Japan around $530 million uh, were stolen. Let's dive into the APT actors. <clears throat> Two major operations, one was done by uh, our company and the other one by uh, a company called Intezer. Anyone know Intezer? Yeah, okay, not a lot. So Intezer, uh, for those of you who don't know, they have an amazing uh, uh, engine, in my opinion. Uh, what it does is code reuse, so it so it takes two binaries from different attacks and just know how to create code similarities and then they can understand whether uh, there is a code reuse in one of the binaries and they can then link it to some threat actor and I will show it to you today. The guy in the picture is Jay Rosenberg. He's one of uh, the best friend mm -hmm. and he is responsible for that research about uh, the continuation of Operation Blockbuster. I don't know if you heard about it. Blockbuster started with the Sony attack back back in the days, um, and this will be like just a, uh, another uh, operation done by Lazarus, and uh, a cover of one of the incident response um, conducted by our team, the great team, the global research and analysis team, um, and we'll see what happened in Apple Juice for those of you who haven't read the article on SecureList. <clears throat> Briefly on the blockbuster, what happened was um, a company, <coughs> sorry, a company got um, a malicious doc, which uh, in his original page included this investment proposal, and the investment proposal um, included a lot of uh, pages in uh, some website um, of the uh, threat actor. So in the proposal, they said that they have like an urgent request for an immediate transaction of $50 million. Like I'm seeing it and I'm like, yes, for me, it's crazy. Yeah, $50 million, come on, it's urgent. We can get it. Uh, but if you download uh, the doc, it immediately injects a remote admin tool and 
takes over the machine. So what Integer did, they took all the samples, and I'm going to go briefly about it because the, uh, the article itself is very long. They detected immediately that it's Lazarus. Why? Because some of the modules, some of the functions were reused from a loader that was already uh, in one of the Lazarus attacks. So, and the, the entire rest of the code was unique. So it wasn't a, in any part of other attacks. It doesn't say a lot, but it, do, but it does uh, create a suspicion around it. If you look a little bit around the models, we can see some common uh, denominators in the Lazarus attack. The uh, get proc address, which loads the modules, was uh, in other uh, operations of Lazarus and other uh, of their binaries. And if we look um, like in a bird view on the rat itself, we can also see that it has a lot of functions and, and a lot of, uh, I mean, command and control functions. And if you go deeply into the article by Jay, um, you will see all the similarities from Lazarus. So it was, um, there was no argument about the origin of, of that attack. So this was uh, one uh, crypto exchange hack that we've seen and uh, documented by Intezer. And another one, which uh, was by my team, uh, a team in uh, Singapore, they uh, were requested to attend an incident response uh, for a crypto exchange which was hacked and initially we had no idea what was the origin of the attack so after a number of days looking into uh, uh, the servers and looking into every computer we finally found something that looks like this anyone recognize this picture no okay anyone read the article by any chance about apple juice i have to i'm from the company i have to <laughs> they pay me to read the articles, create uh, click bytes. Uh, no. <laughs> You're listening, good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is a company, supposedly a company called Sellas, and what they do, uh, they sell or give or sell, uh, we don't know exactly, uh, a trading platform for uh, trading crypto uh, currency. And what we identified is that one of the employees that is already using that platform downloaded an update. And the update is the one that uh, was very suspect, suspicious for us. Inside the update, um, <clears throat> one of the fir first thing that we saw was that it encrypts or it does like XOR operation in order to so on, on information that was extracted from the uh, victim computer. So this is n nothing that you see on, on an uh, original updater. So you don't need to store information unless in some very weird cases. But over here it was obvious that something is, is wrong with the updater. If you look at the network and you capture um, the request to sell us server, you see a number of stuff that raise some eyebrows. One, the user agent is hard-coded and it's not really the same as uh, the, the original one that we see. So this is something that is sign like some sort of a, a fingerprint uh, for them to identify where, um, wi which of the operating system it's coming from. In this specific example, it's Windows. Um, there is another, uh, there is another sample for a Mac OS. I'm not going to get into it in, di in this talk because of lack of time, but uh, we're going to go through the Windows one. Another, <coughs> another interesting area uh, was the content type, and we can see that there is a multi-part. It's called juice. So in general, if I would see a product and it will have a, a crafted multi-part, it won't ri raise some eyebrows, but given all of that together, Something is not, not right here. I mean, the get config is just a random string. What does it does there? And the GIF, I mean, who tries to upload a GIF, which exactly, which is not a GIF. So what we did, what, what we see here is basically an injection of the GIF header with some numbers, and the rest is the actual data that's being exfiltrated from, from the victim machine. Uh, 
so you can see a very suspicious activity doing, done in the uploader. <coughs> when we tracked the, th the attacker, we found out that it's not the only sample that, uh, that he uses. So he kept improving himself and we used a number of uh, detection uh, tactics, but one of them was very easy, the PDB. And the PDB included some string that called T-Manager. And the T-Manager helped us along with other stuff um, to track and uh, understand what are the improvements uh, for that type of uploader, updater. <coughs> After the update contact with the command and control, it will give it two answers, one to, or two options. One, a response 300, meaning that uh, the command and control is not supposed to do anything, just supposed to stand quiet and get information from the victim. Once it gets 200 OK, it means that the command and control is downloading a payload. And this payload, something that we all very know. If you're in the malware scene, if you've seen some of the tools that Lazarus use, you'll be very familiar with that one. So some of the stuff that we've seen already in the past and we've seen here as well, it doesn't matter, like, uh, <coughs> it's just a random, random layout, so it doesn't have to be that, the same order. But what we can see is the, the RC4 16, 16 byte key and uh, the encrypted fault tree loader, so stuff which are very familiar for us. And the fault chill, we all know that it's already been out there and US CERT already uh, uh, attributed the fault chill to Hidden Cobra, which is Lazarus. But who are those sellers? Are they a legitimate company? We have no idea. So we tried to trace them a little bit and we found out that First of all, the, uh, the address of their offices doesn't exist. So we trace back to some place which is, does not exist, uh, some, somewhere in, in, a, in, a, in a field in Netherlands, uh, which is kind of odd. So we don't really know if Lazarus actually owns Celas in some way, or Celas is some company that they infiltrated in. And since they are small, so they registered some box uh, or something of, of that nature. And there's a lot of questions around it. If you ask how did we know it was Lazarus, out of all the evidence that we collected, some of them was very, very unique. One thing was the 16-byte key. As you can see in that picture, the 16-byte key used for RC4 in the fault shield for encrypting the data was also used in a lot of other operations by Lazarus. The infrastructure had an immediate overlap. So you can see that they are still using the command and control server uh, to create these attacks. And something which was rather interesting, I don't know if you can see it from here, it says accept language, KO minus K KP, KOKR, means Korean. Inside the fault chill, loader, there was this string, which is an HTTP header in the Korean language. So this is where I leave you, to Danny. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. So a little bit about a financial jargon that we'll be talking about. Does anyone know long positions, different stock market positions, short orders? market orders. Okay, so a long position is the easiest position to explain the market. I think that, let's say, Bitcoin's gonna go up, I'll buy some Bitcoin, I'm in a long position, it goes down, I lose money, it goes up, I make money. Short position is basically, I think Bitcoin's gonna go down. So let's say Edo is my broker. I say, Edo, can you give me five Bitcoins? I'll take them, take I'll sell them right away, and then I'll have, let's say, a thousand dollars. If Bitcoin goes down, I owe Edo 10 Bitcoins. I'm gonna buy 10 Bitcoins, let's say for $900, give it back, and I made $100. Market order is basically the simplest order in the market. You send the order, you say, I wanna buy 10 Bitcoins at whatever price is available. I, I'll, it'll be 100% execution. I know I'll get my Bitcoins, but I might get it 
at a worse price depending on how the market changes while I execute it. A limit order is, okay, I want to buy 10 Bitcoins at $1,000 and two cents. If I get it, I'll get it. If not, my order will just stay in the queue and won't get executed. Stop loss is an order used to protect yourself from mar if the market goes crazy. So you're saying, okay, I'm in a long position. Looks like the market is going well, but if the market goes down like 10% right away, I don't want to be on my computer watching it all day. I want to have an order that is inactive. Only the moment that it reaches my trigger is going to get triggered, so I don't lose everything. I I kind of protect myself from the market. And liquidity. Liquidity is the degree of how can you buy an asset, how quickly you can get it, and for the price that is posted above. That means that if there's small liquidity in some market and I want to buy the asset and I wait five minutes to buy it, that's very bad. High liquidity markets like foreign exchanges or popular stocks like Apple, the moment you want to buy it, you'll get it. So a small comparison of crypto markets to regular exchanges. Um, first of all, it's a 24 seven market. You have more than 20 venues selling the same type of assets, which is not very common. Um, it is, there's a lot of exchanges for stocks selling the same assets, but this has 20 is an understatement. 20 are the ones that are like pretty big. You have hundreds of them. There's very little institutional traders which means that most people that are trading are not good traders, and you can see it by, I see you there. <laughs> um, you see a lot of like those YouTube videos, you can make very good money, watch this 10 minute video and you're gonna trade. I'm sorry, that's not how it works. People spend years and years of learning how to trade. No financial regulation, um, which means there's a lot of illegal stuff going on, which you won't see in regular markets. No security standards, which that's why they get hacked every year. <laughs> yeah. No circuit breakers, which is something implemented in the stock market that if the something goes crazy and stock just start shooting up or down, like you had a flash crash, which um, S&P and like Dow Jones lost 1,000 points, you shut down trading just to see what the situation is. And weird behaviors, since there's no regulation, they can just say, oh, we're going under maintenance in five minutes, no more trading, and whatever your orders are in there, you cannot do anything. And no brokers, so in the regular market, you cannot access, the, there is direct market access, but NASDAQ will now let you just connect to the computers right away, which is, you connect to a broker and that's why there's a lot of DDoS attacks happening on crypto exchanges because you connect to their engines right directly. So market manipulation. Um, Watch trading is basically used to make an illusion of liquidity. So we'll see later how stock, um, crypto exchanges are ranked. So you basically buy and sell to yourself. And then when you look at the total daily volume, there's a lot of volume going on because Volume is people exchanging money. It's a dollar volume of an asset exchanging hands. And spoof trading or order spoofing, by the way, watch trading is illegal. <laughs> and then order spoofing, which is also illegal, is basically making, putting in an order which you do not intend to execute just to make a false impression of supplier demand. So why would they do watch trading? You can see this is how exchanges are ranked. You go to coin market cap, you look at the exchanges. Daily volume is something that like, if you have high daily volume, people will trade. You have liquidity, you probably have the best prices there and you can get your orders executed. So since volume is a big factor of, okay, I own an exchange, I want the most volume I can get from my exchange. How about I trade with myself? So um, Mount Gox, how do I, Okay, uh, Mount Gox, which was hacked, the biggest leak was in 2014. We got some of the transaction files, which is very nice. You can't do it in any other exchange. So you can see user IDs and the trades they made. So this is one user ID. Oh, that's a small sample of trades from him. This is about 14 seconds of him trading. So you can see that 
his amount in about these four trades, which are about five seconds and three seconds from each other, this is 0 0.04 bitcoins for the same price. And then three seconds later, he sells the same amount for the same price. There's no reason, first of all, a person cannot do that. That's way too fast for trading. That's a, it's a bot. Second of all, why would you buy for the same price and sell for the same price? There's no profit for you. So there's thousands of examples of that happening in just that one file. Aura spoofing. So we start with aura spoofing. Let's say I want to manipulate the price. I have a lot, a lot of Bitcoin. And you look at the daily volume and you see, okay, one Bitcoin per minute or is traded. So I'll put a very big order at once and I'll put it as a limit order. That means I don't want it to get executed. I'll put, it'll stay in the queue. The queue is basically ordered by the price you're willing to sell or buy. The highest in the ask queue, which is the people that are um, willing to sell, you'll have the people selling for the highest price first. In the bid queue, people that want to buy, you'll have the people for the cheapest price, they'll be first and they'll go down. So you'll position yourself around third or fourth, whatever you want to be. And everyone behind you is going to notice, okay, he puts a huge order. I'm not going to get my order executed until he'll have all of his executed. So they'll start jumping above me. They'll start changing the prices and going above me. So the price will start rising or going down. So if I want to buy for cheap, I'll do it on the queue for the people that want to sell and then I'll make it go down. They'll go down and then I'll buy after. So what they do is they put this order, price starts going down and they cancel it right away. So it's, a, it's an illusion. Then that person is going to buy for the cheap price because he just made it go down, go to the other side. He'll go to the other side and do the same thing over there, start hiking the price up, cancel it, and then sell right away when he got it up. So he'll basically make the price go down with an illusion, cancel his big supply, price will go down, he'll buy it, he'll do the same thing for the other side, He'll make a, an illusion of a lot of demand. Price goes up and then he sells what he just bought. And yeah, so he makes a, a small profit, does it thousands of times a day, makes a lot of money, highly illegal in regular markets, regulated. There is a lot of software for detecting that and happening. I mean, if I had some time for them, I would show you that live right now in one of the exchanges that always happens. So this is basically a cumulative sum of the offers and bids. You can see the people right there wanting to buy, people willing to sell the higher prices, and this is called a wall. This is basically a spoof wall. So this is someone putting a huge order and everyone behind them is like, my order is not gonna get executed. They'll start jumping here, price starts going up. So an, an interesting, we were working on the presentation and then I, I found some different price manipulations which I had no idea how they happened, like prices hiking up 10% out of nowhere. So this is how we connected target attacks and price manipulations. So Bitmex, which is, has the highest volume of all the exchanges, goes down for maintenance at 1 a.m. Right here we can see this is the price from a different exchange, uh, which also has high volume, but not as high as BitMEX. So when a big exchange with a lot of volume goes down, the total volume goes down of the whole crypto um, exchanges. So every, an or, you don't need a huge order to make the price move up because there's not a lot of volume now. You put in 2000 Bitcoin order, you'll make the price hike because there's no trading going on in BitMEX. So people are not um, looking at the prices in both exchanges because so that's usually have um, high frequency bots that look at, try to do arbitrage between exchanges, see, oh, this is too low here. So they start, they start trying to compare it and that's how the prices um, average out usually. So we can see that in BitMEX, BitMEX goes down, no trading, and Bitfinex, someone comes in, puts in a huge order at the exact same moment, 1 a.m. Um, so, and this is the volume throughout the day, this is the volume after. So you see something is suspicious here, like 
exactly the one moment that the bigger exchange goes down, someone comes in and puts in a huge order and makes the price go up like crazy. So I was talking about stop losses. So for an exchange, having a lot of people doing short positions is a bit risky because they basically let them borrow. They give them credit. So the more credit you give, and if there's a risk of the credit is, is gonna default somehow, if the prices go up way too much, people are not gonna be able to afford to give you the money. Um, so for Bitfinex, um, that day was one of the highest points I ever had off short positions. And not saying that it's a fact, but some people think that they might want to cut some of those positions. So how do you cut those positions? Most people that do have stop losses um, that are in short positions, they'll put a stop loss. If the price goes too high, liquidate. So you saw the spike in the price, and at that same moment, the number of short positions just goes down considerably. So this is from the Twitter account of Bitfinex, uh, BitMEX. People are saying, okay, so we completed our maintenance, we're in cancel only mode. Cancel only mode means you can only cancel orders that you have open. And then people are saying, it takes f you have, we have five minutes to cancel the order, but it takes six minutes to log in. Servers are overloaded, and then they're going on, oh, we have some more difficulties, and then out of nowhere, oh, we're, we're having a DDoS attack on us. Very convenient, same moment. And then we stabilize DDoS attack, which, and then again, one more DDoS attack, we're trying to mitigate. Anyway, people that had their orders in could not cancel them, could not do anything. Um, and if you go to their Twitter, you'll see people saying, I just lost like $10,000 out of nowhere for, couldn't cancel my order. So, concluding this part, even though this was maintenance, hopefully, <laughs> if they're uh, legit, if not, these exchanges, we looked at them, most of them were not even protected by Cloudflare. So it shouldn't be that hard to do a DDoS attack, and if you can take uh, an ex down an exchange with considerable amount of volume, you can play with the prices and make a very, very nice profit for yourself. So concluding, crypto exchanges lack security best practices. It's not improving, hacks are getting, they're not getting more complex, there's not better tactics of the attackers, the same phishing emails. A lot of manipulation is being made, no regulation, we don't, it's not clear if there will be any regulation. APT actors want money, and a lot of non-APT actors want money as well. Yeah, but specifically before you move to, the, to mm -hmm. that thought, um, so we know that Lazarus is a cyber espionage and cyber sabotage type of uh, actor, uh, but we also uh, have one of their units which we um, which we also track, and we are, we know that they are after financial gain and they have the means to create such attacks, and whether it's from the inside or from the outside, uh, there is there is no hundred percent in understanding how the crypto exchange is working and whether it's under attack or not, but someone is controlling, um, someone is controlling them in some way, and that facts that Jenny, Danny just uh, spoke about are not happening by mistake or human error, you know? So someone is manipu manipulating that, and that's why we wanted to emphasize the connection between the APT actors um, and the actual vulnerabilities. You want me to continue? Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> um, attribution may be possible with attacks like Edo showed where you have a sample, but attacks on exchanges, financial attacks, are pretty much impossible to attribute unless the exchange opens up and says, oh, look at our transaction book, um, which they probably won't do, and they're not required to do. So it's very, very hard to attribute it. And then we also don't know if it was an attack or an APT or was it just a malicious group of traders that want to make some money. And like we said right now, we're not sure if the DDoS attack caused that, but soon enough people will figure out that they can manipulate prices of yeah. uh, 
unregulated markets, and we'll see pretty complex attacks. I mean, we can say from, from our side um, that Kaspersky is tracking these type of attacks all the time, and we, we will see in the future some sophisticated attacks, specifically either it's from Lazarus or from other uh, type of APTs, uh, but this gap that me and Danny just spoke about, and we, we have some questions marks, some question marks, we'll probably have solutions, or we'll probably have answers in the upcoming future about uh, who's linking, who's linked to those DDoS attacks and whether it's the same uh, group who's attacking the exchanges. Any questions? So how do, you, how do you know that the... You haven't raised your hand. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I used to be a teacher. Yeah. No, um, I don't think that you can create a faulty loader from scratch and intentionally inject the Korean language. Maybe you can take the entire sample well, as is. I've got, I've got my hack Lazarus, you know, and, and steal Lazarus from them and then try to adapt somebody and say, and say to everybody, whoa, we are to move back to North Korea, let's start the third world war, right? Right. We've been discussing false flags a, a lot. Uh, specifically on Lazarus when they had uh, false flags about some Russian APTs and uh, we also had Fancy Bear when, where they had false flags about other APTs. So we've seen that. We cannot be 100% sure that uh, we're not mistaken, you know. Sometimes my boss, Kostin, I don't know if you know Kostin Ryo, uh, he's always saying, you know, I think maybe we're in the matrix and we just made a huge mistake and the entire chain of, you know, articles and news and, and everything we're based on is probably a big mistake. But, you know, we'll never know. At the moment, what we're doing is simple math and we get the answers. So, yeah, it's a big question mark whether someone hacked someone or spoofing or impersonating. But um, from the evidence that we have and as humans at the moment, that's what, what we see. Other I have a question. I have a question. Um, did for me? Not for you. Oh, okay. You know what I was talking about. No, because uh, if it's in finance, I don't. Yes, yeah, so all the finance interviews. This is the first time we're doing some, a presentation which trying to connect both world, worlds. Um, was it clear? If it was clear or almost clear, raise your hand. Ask okay. the question. Ask the question. <laughs> I'm not a teacher. He what was a teacher. What is the stop loss? <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.